So consider volumetric strain. And this is important to us in geomechanics. Well, the change of volume over volume, of course. That's governed by this part of the strain tensor in 2D. So under plain strain, conditions, the pressure to show that it's So as as the Poisson ratio approaches a half, what happens to the pressure? Go, goes to infinity, right? And this is known as volumetric locking. And the quad four has the same effect. Nothing changes between the same idea here. Pressure goes to infinity as the Poisson ratio goes to a half. And so this, this is all derived from the quad four, but the, con the, the three node triangle, or we also called it the constant strain triangle, also exhibits similar locking. And locking doesn't Locking doesn't necessarily mean Im immovability. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, I mean, the, you actually can have scenarios where the thing, the mesh will just lock. It won't do anything, okay? But it doesn't necessarily imply that in this context. When you use the word locking in the context of finite elements, uh, really what we're meaning is just that there's an excessive stiffness. And one, you know, one way to alleviate it is to use higher order elements. So for example, The Q8 or the eight noted quad now you have a quadratic interpolation along the sides, so the eight noted quad is capable of capturing deformation modes accurately in bending. And just to give you some examples, if I have a cantilever beam 
and I mesh it with constant strain triangles, three node triangles. So there, let's say there's 40 degrees of freedom. So my drawing's not the scale. I mean, if you count the nodes, this, this is probably not correct. So this is with three nodes. If I apply a force, so it, it's cantilevered, so it's fixed on this end, and I apply a force to this end, the result will only be one quarter of the exact answer due to locking. If I go to the Q4s, so if I use a Q4 also with 40 degrees of freedom, I'll get about 0.67 of the exact answer. If I use linear strain triangles, so these are triangles that would have mid-side nodes. Six-noded tri. And I use 48 degrees of freedom here. I'll get 99% of the exact answer. If I use Q8s with only 20 degrees of freedom, I'll get 93% of the exact answer. So Q8 is a, also has mid-side nodes. We haven't really talked about this element in this class. There's also something called a Q9. So it has midpoint nodes in addition. And with only 24 degrees of freedom, I can get 99% of the exact answer with a Q9. And we also didn't talk about this guy, but we can also have a beam element. So one beam element, I can get the exact answer. <laughs> but we use a different type of interpolation for that. It's not really relevant to everything else we're doing in the class. But just so, just so you know. OK. So let me see if my example works. I was having some problems with it earlier. So the gray there is my undeformed beam, and the pink is my deformed beam. And this is the vector that's proportional to the force I'm applying to the end. So when I, you'll see me grab it and pull up on it, I'm actually increasing the force, right? And it, it also, uh, the direction too, it's not just straight vertical. I can, I can, I can actually push on the end of the beam too, and it will resist extension. Right, so it's not, it's not, these are, these are solid, you know, plain elasticity elements. So they, they're not just beam bars, right, or, or beams. Bars only resist extension, beams only resist rotation. These are plain elasticity elements. So even though I, I make it look like a beam, it's, it's really a, a structure, right? And so I start off with these really poorly shaped poorly shaped uh, elements and in plain stress condition as I increase the force nothing's happening it's not bending 
And if I use a Q8, boom. Right? So the first one I showed was a Q4. So I, I have a little button here. I change to a Q4, boom, it's locked. Right? And it and it doesn't matter what how much force I apply. So if, if I go back to the Q8, now you know it bends proportional to the force I apply. Increase the force, it bends like it should, right? Q4, boom, locks. All right. So, yeah. Am I right that we have like more than two elements in these problems? Well, again, remember with with the scenario we outlined in theory was when the ratio was bad, A to B. The ratio A to B is bad, you get locking in plain stress. And so I'm trying to exhibit that. Okay? You're right. If I increase the mesh with a Q4, so now I have more nodes, with a Q4 I get some, see, so that now with Q4 or Q8, there's very little difference, right? Again, if I use a bad mesh and Q4s, boom, locks. So it's just something to be aware of, right? Because, you know, I mean, obviously, if you solve this, if you're solving a beam problem, right, you know the analytic solution, you compare your result to the analytic solution, you know, you know, this is bad, right? But if you're solving something at, you know, a reservoir scale and a million degrees of freedom, this could be going on in the middle of your simulation and you would never know it unless you're aware of what to look for. And the thing to look for in plain stress, which is an assumption you'd never make in a reservoir anyway, but not plain strain. We'll get to that problem in a second, right? Plain stress, bad shaped elements, it's going to lock with Q4s, right? So how do you alleviate it? You either use a Q8 or use a better mesh, right? Or more degrees of freedom. Remember, this is much more expensive to compute than just the two elements. Right? So now let's look at plain strain. Right? So plain strain scenario, increase the Poisson ratio near a boom. Near half, locked. Can't do anything. So I increase the force. Nothing happens. It's locked. Under plain strain, when you have nearly incompressible material, you have locking. And this is very relevant to geomechanics, right? Because we use a plain strain assumption a lot. If we don't want to do true 3D, right? We use a plain strain assumption. And we deal with materials that, in many cases, are nearly incompressible. Okay, so that's really all I can show you today. We'll revisit this next time because there are some ways to get around this problem. One of them is called reduced integration, but it has its own set of problems, as you can see. That's not, that is the solution that is computed. And we'll talk about why that is next time. But in order to know what reduced integration is, you first have to know what Gauss integration is. And that's in the lecture that you're supposed to watch before Thursday. OK? So that was the one I missed from a couple weeks ago that I never made up. I need you guys to watch that before Thursday. Well, and you'll see, instead of, instead of, you know, so far we've always just exactly integrated the stiffness matrices. Okay. But in practice, we don't really do that. We use something called Gauss integration. And it's much faster, much cheaper. And once you know what Gauss integration is, we can talk about reduced or full integration. And we'll revisit this example. OK? So any questions? On, you know, uh, 